This show is brought to you in part by Bogart Extractors, an industry leader revolutionizing hydrocarbon extraction. Licensed facilities can rest assured that Bogart's certified systems meet all industry standards. They are peer-reviewed by a third-party engineer to ensure your facility and its employees can operate safely. And each stainless steel unit is built and tested right here in the USA. Bogart's functional extractors boast a faster and more cost-effective process with features like hydrocarbon falling films to supercharge evaporation rates, heavy-duty explosion-proof pumps for flammable liquid or vapor, industrial chillers capable of maintaining large tanks of solvent at temperatures well below negative 60 degrees Celsius, and Bogart offers extensive tech support and consultation services. So whether you need to set up an extraction lab from scratch or simply need some replacement gaskets, Bogart is a phone call away at 855-553-3887 or visit bogart.com. That's B-H-O-G-A-R-T dot com. Welcome. You're listening to Casually Baked, the podcast, home base for the can of curious. Thanks for tuning in. It's Time. We had a hard time together, together. Yes, it's a hard time. We had a hard time. Together. Hi, y'all. I'm Joe, your host and cannabis lifestyle guide. And I'm back with another candid conversation with a woman mixing things up in the cannabis industry. If you want to usher in change and have your voice heard, listen, people, we all know you need to be sitting at the table where those plans are being made and the deals are getting done. And here to inspire us is Marie Momarquet, co-founder of MD Numbers, Inc., a 100% Black-owned family of vertically integrated cannabis brands, including MD Farms, Marie's Deliverables, and Legacy Coterie. Together, they provide a range of goods and services to the California supply chain, retail customers, and the equity community. Marie is a legacy cannabis operator who's been passionate about the plant for over 13 years, and her cannabis business expertise and equity activism have put her in the national spotlight. Marie and her co-founder, Alan Hackett, are also minority owners of Cannabis Express, having helped build one of the Bay Area's biggest delivery providers. In addition to developing and scaling successful cannabis businesses, Marie is focused on being an advocate for social justice and equity in the industry. She's an advisor to the Cannabis Equity Program for Success Centers and offers monthly tours to MD Farms for equity applicants. I gotta say, it was such a delight chopping it up with Marie. And I'm excited to share our chat with you. But first, a word from our sponsor, MJ Relief, the muscle rub PhD formulated for what aches and pains you. And this week, I've got a couple of rave reviews from Dallas, Texas. My sister Bambi is a personal trainer as well as an MJ Relief wholesale partner. She recently sent me a screenshot of this feedback from one of her fitness clients. I love the MJ cream. I was in pain after my workout today. It gave me such relief. Thank you, thank you, coach. Now, two days earlier, she'd sent me this message. A client came in today rubbing her bicep. I gave her a little of my open tube of MJ relief to put on it, and she said it worked immediately. She's a believer. Anyway, I thought I'd put a smile on your face. Yes, thank you, sister. I am most definitely smiling. Now, if you're not smiling because you've got muscle and joint pain and you want some relief of your own, I got good news. Save 10% on MJ Relief through the holidays using promo code CASUALLYBAKED at checkout. Shop online for you and the ones you love at mjskinrelief.com. That's MJSkin, R-E-L-I-E-F dot com. Promo code CASUALLYBAKED, all one word, for 10% savings. And if you're a body worker, personal trainer, gym, or shop owner, let's collaborate, my friend. 
Email info at mjskinrelief.com to become a wholesale partner. The Sustainability Roll-Up is presented by OCB Rolling Papers. In perfect harmony with natural, sustainable practices, it's always been the OCB signature to provide the highest quality, responsibly sourced, and sustainably crafted rolling papers. Today, we are stepping up for sustaining the diversity of cannabis as both a culture and an industry. Later on in my chat with Marie, she talks about the work she's doing to empower equity business owners. As part of her pro bono work, Marie is a member of the Working Group Coalition who created a Cannabis Social Equity Program Advocacy Handbook, providing baseline policy recommendations for true access and profit participation in the global cannabis economy for communities destroyed by the war on drugs. This free 43-page guide is the brainchild of Black and Brown social equity applicants, Black and Brown social equity license holders, activists, compliance directors, and cannabis operators who came together to lend their expertise and firsthand experience of what to do and, more importantly, what not to do. As more and more states and nations decriminalize cannabis and create the initial framework of this new industry— it's become increasingly clear that efforts must be made to actively fight and advocate for access-driven policy every step of the journey. And what's so cool about this advocacy handbook is that it doesn't matter what state you live in. It is a blueprint to, one, advocate for uncapped licenses with the accompanying zoning rights. Two, advocate for more access to social equity programs and expanded definitions of who is eligible and what communities were destroyed by the racist war on drugs and the accompanying multi-generational community divestment. And three, advocate for better oversight of social equity programs, both at the local, state, and federal levels using existing frameworks. The handbook's introduction accurately spells out that the American cannabis industry is approaching a crucial inflection point, where large, privately held corporations operating on national and international growth plans are acquiring pools of cannabis licenses at an exponential rate. Their growth and their projected profits, they come at the expense of the black and brown communities that were destroyed by the failed war on drugs. The collective experience of the Working Group Coalition revealed that the only way to create an equitable, access-driven path for Black and Brown communities into cannabis is to actively advocate in person to our local, state, and federal governments to assure that the initial policy framework of the industry, it secures the profits for the communities that were and are continuing to be destroyed by the failed war on drugs. They are so right. You got to be in the room. You need a seat at the table. So if you're unsure where to start, have no fear. Marie has shared a link to the Cannabis Social Equity Program Advocacy Handbook. It's a fucking mouthful, but if you just click the link, easy peasy, 43 pages of a blueprint for you to learn from and work from. And while you're checking out those show notes... You can catch my smoke sesh with Marie on the latest episode of Roll With Me. I think I was rolling the OCB bamboo papers. Marie went with OCB hemp. No matter which OCB rolling papers you choose, you can be assured OCB only uses natural acacia gum for an always sticks experience. And all OCB papers are even burning, vegan, GMO free, chlorine free, and dye free. If you're shopping for a cannabis newbie this holiday season, might I suggest gifting them with joint rolling skills. Get a Roll With Me starter kit at ocbusa.com backslash baked. You'll get four booklets of OCB and a rolling tray for only $4.99. This bundle is worth $20 and is around for a limited time. And of course, you must be 21 and older to buy OCB rolling papers and to follow the natural wonders of OCB on social, at OCB underscore USA. Ask for OCB wherever you buy your rolling papers. 
If you're picking up what I'm putting down, please rate and review Casually Baked the podcast on iTunes or Apple Podcasts. That one small action helps other can of curious folks find highly responsible discussions like this one with Marie. Pulling back the curtain on social equity programs and sharing insights for succeeding in cannabis. We also discuss how the monopolization of our industry is happening at warp speed and the importance of advocating for equity and inclusivity to protect the diversity and heritage of cannabis. And we explore some ideas for protecting small farms and setting equity cannabis businesses up for success. So smoke them if you got them and settle in. It's time to get casually baked. I got the bottle of wine. We've got Marie Momarquet. She is the co-founder of MD Numbers, which is a California vertically integrated cannabis business that she started with her brother. And I've been hearing the buzz about you guys recently saw something. You were in a a German magazine. You were featured in TH Scene, um, which is kind of cool. And so I've been hearing a lot about your business, but I know nothing about your origin story, Marie. So could you tell me how all this got started for you? Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me on here. I love the love the show, love the format, and super happy to be here. Origin story, I'm from Nashville, Tennessee. So I heard the twang in your voice. I <laughs> was born and raised in Nashville, Tennessee. Uh, went to college at University of Tennessee, Knoxville. Was going to go to law school. Um, have a degree in political science and psychology. And after college, I was just trying to get to California from all the experience I had in college selling and brokering cannabis and hanging around people that really enjoyed pot. And I realized I'm in the wrong place at the wrong time and I need to get to California. So I really just had the passion for engaging in cannabis in any way I could. And I was just mind blown that I could legally participate if I got to the right place. So after college, I just did everything I could to get to California. In 2010, I moved to California. So I've been here 11 years. And my brother and I got started with our first Prop 215 cannabis company. We got started in delivery in 2015. And that was with Marie's Deliverables. And then we opened up a second location in Los Angeles. And we opened up our farm, uh, which is a cultivation facility, 50,000 square feet of mixed light production in Salinas, California. And we've had that since 2017. And so it's just been like evolving in Prop 215, right? To try to prepare for Prop 64. So a part of our origin story is definitely just being fortunate to get started, not necessarily early, but in time for us to transition and have like the wherewithal to get a little bit of the uh, understanding under our belt of how the permitting was gonna work and where we could get grandfathered in, where we were gonna have issues. So. Um, 2017, we just prepared to transition everything into Prop 64, our delivery, our farm. Um, we got distribution, cultivation, processing on our on our farm with nurseries. So that's extremely amazing. And we were able to like slowly come into compliance there. And then um, my brother's also from the South and came out here after making sure like, like by the skin of his chin, staying out of trouble and making sure that he could come out of here and uh also participate in the compliant market so it's just been like a little bit of a whirlwind getting to you know 2018 which is where all the corporate cannabis really began right yeah so are you big sister little sister we're funny we call each other brother and sister but we're we're not by blood but we're closer than blood we say so we've been together for 15 years now doing different things in cannabis and just having a really tight bond. So it's funny. We're not actually brother and sister, but everybody thought we were boyfriend and girlfriend. I'm like, that's my brother. That's my brother. And by the time, like I'm closer to him than my actual family. So yeah, I would call my brother, but he, we're actually the same age. Literally. Okay. So, apart. so who was the one that really had the business mind to get this going? Because yeah, everybody that loves cannabis dreams of getting into the industry, but I mean, you did it and it's been no nonsense climbing the ladder the whole time. So where does that come from? When I was in Knoxville, Tennessee, I had enough red flags to be like, I got to get out of here, right? So <laughs> I moved out here 11 years ago and I just knew I was still had my day job at the time, but I was like, 
figuring out all the different elements of Prop 215 and starting to build relationships and working with different companies. Like my first experience was going around to every single storefront in the Bay and trying to sell them this capsule. And it was funny. Um, so I was just like, I don't want to do that, but I need to figure out how to make money. And then delivery was such a low hanging fruit. And I'm like harassing my brother this whole time. Like, come to California, come to California, come to like whatever you're like, anything that you get involved with over there is going to cause you delays. Like the faster you can get out of here, the better. Right. So I got everything done for the delivery to get started. And then he came out here like immediately when we launched. So it was basically a tag team because he's, he's very like enterprising. I like to do something small, build from there, do something small. He's like, he has a very visionary when it comes to like the empire building and he has big, big dreams. So it yeah, you're like plant the seed, let it grow. And he's like, dream big motherfuckers. Yeah, literally. <laughs> yeah. he, he is like, why would we do that when we could have 10 acres or why would we do that? When I'm like, okay, like, oh, well, let's do that then. Right. Like, so it's been really complimentary, especially for going from small beginnings to something much larger. You know, with me leaving Texas and getting here by way of it, are you ready to make bad days a thing of the past? I invite you to explore the why behind the things you do every day that make you feel awesome. In his new book, Make It a Great Day, author Jarrett Robertson shares small ideas you can use to feel your best. So the next time you're looking for ways to improve your day or mood, you're empowered to do just that. Your day can't control you when you follow this roadmap to thrive. Purchase Make It a Great Day on Audible or online at makeitagreatday.ca. One of the things that I figured out really quickly as well. If you want to build something, California is like 10x. It just goes so fast. And you can take an idea and build something in half the time that you could in most other places. Or like if I were trying to do what I'm doing now in Texas, people already say that we're early adopters or something but in california it's like no this is not early adopting right you right. know it's like develop it's like crazy because we had such a developed network and just the business structure and then we threw it all out the window and then created a whole new one when prop 64 came so yeah we've got so much history good and bad i guess you know you're relatively young to have a vertically integrated operation here in California. So what are some of the things that you've learned to help you succeed in cannabis here in California? That's a great question. I would say, number one, the, the cannabis industry is so small. So doing good business has definitely come first and foremost for my brother and I from Prop 215 all the way through Prop 64, just making sure that, you know, we're we're breaking bread with people and we're doing really good business throughout that is has really taken us probably further than any other piece of business intelligence, which is interesting. Um, starting in delivery was crucial because as far as like touching so many facets of cannabis, you get to see them all in delivery. You're dealing with marketing, you're dealing with e-commerce, you're dealing with logistics, you're handling, you know, managing all your drivers, managing your managers. It's just a, a piece of each part of the supply chain so you're building these relationships with vendors i think for us starting in delivery and like you said california is so rapid so you know when i started the delivery my humble goal is just to replace my previous position i'm like i just want to make six figures like be comfortable start this delivery and then immediately i was like oh this is going to be a lot larger than i ever initially expected right just because California has so many capabilities when you're doing good business, when you have good products, like we were very medically oriented. So we've always served like a, a niche market that wanted consultation, wanted CBD and wanted to learn not what the highest THC percentage, here's my money, what's the cheapest thing I can get, here's my money. So we've always tried to have a good customer base that was really well-rounded and saw the benefit in what we were doing, especially starting the end of 2016, you know, it was obviously a well-developed situation, but delivery wasn't. Um, people were really still doubtful when it comes to delivery. So just being on the forefront of that and giving people a really good experience and making sure that they can have a trusted place to go to, it went really far for us. So I think I answered your question, but definitely like the delivery piece and just 
always making sure that we're doing good business and building those connections because you know no matter what happens like even right now where prices are down if you have those connections with those distributors that have always been buying from you for years and years when things are up and things are down you're going to be better off than not building those relationships and then when shit hits the fan you've got no one that's going to help you so you know in your early days you said you were in college and you were selling weed was there anything that you learned in that little time that helped you or kind of crafted the way you put together Marie's deliverables? Yeah, that's a really cool question. Never been asked that. But I always had this idea when I was building Marie's deliverables, like I wanted it to feel like your neighborhood person, like your neighborhood guy that you would call for cannabis, probably your neighbor, probably in your apartment complex. But you guys had like a solidified relationship, not only that, but they're part of your daily experience, like your daily habits, literally. So we wanted to be that guy, but offer all the professionalism, offer all the variety of the products, offer all the consultative experiences that they wanted. And then I've learned, I mean, it's just like, don't be a fool. You know, when you're selling weed in Tennessee, you learn very quickly, like what's safe, what's not safe. And just being able to bring that element to it, discretion, and just understanding what different types of patients are looking for when it comes to discretion, right? Mm -hmm. So even though we're in California, even though it's super legal, not everybody wants you stomping up to their door with the weed hat on, right? <laughs> so like, <laughs> really making sure that we were like digging into our customer needs. And we always started with like, tell us what you want. You know, if you want something specific, we'll go get it. We have nothing against, you know, making those. And my previous position, was in wholesale supply chain. So I just always wanted to have like a few horses, what I call a horse, like move product and maybe they're buying it at cost and then be able to offer that product to a lot more people without losing money. So we just have used a little bit of like all these experiences over time to try and like still definitely give you that consultative weed man experience. In California, one thing that everyone has noticed is like ever since 2018 started, everything became really digital. Like if you didn't have a way to place an order online only as a customer, then, you know, you couldn't order from three fourths of the different delivery services that were created. A lot of people cut inbound calls. They just became very, very like it's, you can feel like it's just robotic. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a bot responding to you. There's not actually a person. So I think all of those things from actually like being in Tennessee and just seeing how people really do prefer to buy cannabis like some want it brought to their door some are going to come and get in your car every time like there's just a different experience for everyone so i think like the evolutions of that is interesting you know I, my oldest sister her and her husband they raised their family in a little town outside of franklin tennessee oh. and all of my nieces and nephews have a loving relationship with cannabis. And one of them would talk about wanting to be in the industry. And, you know, parents are like, we want you to go to college. And I'm like, but he could go to cannabis college at Oaksterdam. He'd Good. be right up the road from me. I could check in on him. And so I like to see that some kid right. from Tennessee was like, you know what? I want to do this and I want to do it the right way. So I'm going to go find a market. Heck yeah. It's amazing to see like all these different educational experiences now for cannabis. I went to Oaksterdam not long ago. Um, so that was, even that was mind blowing to me from a kid from Tennessee. Like there's a weed college, like I can go to California and go to Oaksterdam. That's mind blowing. I actually went on a scholarship from the nonprofit that I work with. So it was just so like full circle um, to get to go there. And I definitely like, that's one of the coolest places you can get educated. Now, um, UC, University of California, SF State is offering some sort of cannabis class. Like a lot yeah. of, uh, I did like an interesting panel with UCLA and they have like a, a separate kind of coalition for cannabis that they've built. So I am really excited to see like the future educational pathways. As I've always said, there's been, you know, a prohibition on research, a prohibition on education. Yes. As well as the criminalization, right? So this is so cool to see like kids like me and kids like you and your nephews and nieces, like, you know, we can understand that the legislation isn't right. We want to educate ourselves and experience cannabis. Certainly. And I interviewed a couple of pharmacists and I also interviewed a veterinarian who's a veterinarian surgeon. 
And none of them learned anything about the endocannabinoid system when they were going to school. And so, you know, the fact that we have all of these uneducated doctors, it's like it's not their fault. You know, they're part of an educational system that has so much bullshit caked on top that it's like you can't get through to like, what's the real real? You know, it's just this is what we want you to know. And I feel like now all these layers are getting pulled back and people are getting to see like, oh, we were neglected this information. And so when they have an opportunity to add it back in and, you know, now they've been out of college 30 years or something and they've got all this fresh new information it's completely changing the way they integrate Eastern and Western medicine or how plant medicine can be a complementary option or even help alleviate the the pharmaceuticals in people's lives or, you know, the shit that they're giving their pets. And that's the whole reason they didn't get to learn it is because right. of, you know, special interests. And exactly. So, you know, people like Greenflower who are, you know, making this big push at the universities across the country to get these educational programs implemented, it's just going to keep snowballing and people are just going to keep waking up. And it's just so fun to be a part of that and like watch it right now. Absolutely. I think that when I was always smoking weed in Tennessee, you know, it was like, it was to get high. I wouldn't have said I was a medical user. And as I learned, I was instantly like, oh, I'm preventatively smoking all day. Who knows all the different things that I'm helping with? But then when I started treating people in the capacity of delivery, and I had people with cancer, have people with different terminal illnesses, and see for my own eyes, their lives extended for years, and their quality of life increased dramatically. I had a friend from high school whose mom had metastatic cancer came back five times um, when they reached out to me she was supposed to only live six months but we added two years to that using rick timpson oil and some breeze mints was her her preference so it's just insane to see like you know we know the science doesn't match the legislation when i went to oaksterdam one of the craziest points that i've always thought about was like how many peer-reviewed clinical studies there are of cannabis and you compare that to how many peer-reviewed clinical studies there are with a lot of opiates that we use or Adderall, for instance, that we give kids. Like, don't let kids have drugs yet. We give them Adderall. And Adderall had under 300 clinical reviewed peer studies when I went to Oaksterdam. And just the comparison of that just blew my mind. But again, I've been in Tennessee. I've been, I've had conversations with nurses that were telling me how you know, families were more upset when they caught their kids smoking weed than alcohol. And I'm like, and drawing more information out, and of course, she's really anti-cannabis. And I'm like, well, the stigmas are created by the law. And that's it. Until the law, the moment the law changed, everybody's like, well, yeah, we were smoking weed since high school. What are you guys talking about? But the fact that the stigma is so strong, and even for us in California, there's still extreme amount of stigma associated to like being a mom using cannabis or different. Like we just got, I saw the other day that can't be tested now for cannabis and different um, jobs. I forget what city or state it was in, but I'm like- Nevada just passed that not too long ago, I know. That's amazing. Like these, these are like common, it's a drug that's never killed anyone, yet yeah. we're sitting here fighting for common sense legalization. Well, and somebody recently brought to my attention that in some states, if you have a cannabis medical card, you can't own a firearm or something. So it's like they make these weird correlations. It doesn't make any sense. And, you know, one of the biggest problems I find in California is the fact that because a lot of that stigma still exists and you have the NIMBYs who don't want a brick and mortar in their community, then we still have so many people that are purchasing on the legacy market instead of stepping up and and trying to do it the right way and pay the fucking ridiculous ass taxes. But we have an overproduction of cannabis because we don't have enough places for it to go. Have you dealt with any of that stuff or does that help you since you have a delivery service? You know, what are your thoughts on all that? I think it's really interesting. Like to the NIMBY point, I was on a panel or some sort of educational thing with San Diego and I was like, 
to my point to the supervisors, just like there's so much weed being sold every day in San Diego. Like you guys would think you would want a piece of it. Like making sure that you can license these things in a way that are bringing the legacy market in and the traditional market in instead of us having to compete with someone that we're never going to beat. You know, we're never going to be the local weed man if the local weed man is selling the same quality for half the price. Yeah. So definitely a thing. I will say, like, as of recent, since May, prices have definitely dropped drastically in California, a lot earlier than they do, a lot lower than they do. So it was some interesting supply chain um, issues happening. And this is where I kind of go back to that point about the network that you have and the connections that you have, because our farm produces far more than our delivery could ever sell. Um, And we are growing in like one acre. So, but right now we're building out four more. So it's like, we will always harvest more than we can vertically integrate. The vertical integration is definitely necessary and key. A lot of our flour still goes to like wholesale distributors as well in bulk pounds. Um, So just making sure that we had really solidified those relationships when the prices started dropping and people become far more selective about whose cannabis they're going to take things that were cash on delivery all of a sudden turned to oh we'll pay in two weeks we'll pay in a month and we're just kind of like but making sure that they're picking up our cannabis number one so like the glutton of cannabis on the market right now is definitely interesting um because we're small it's been pretty manageable for us versus i know a lot of larger cultivators that let's say they pull down a thousand pounds a week it's really hard to sell a thousand pounds a week when the market falls out from under you right and then that's you see people basically like it reminds me of when my like 2015, I was close to someone that had a storefront and we would see a lot of the the vendors come in. I'd be in there learning and listening and she would wait for those vendors that just needed to pay a light bill. Like somebody failed to pay them later on that week. They're walking in. It's something unbelievable. The quality is there, but the price is half because he just needs that money today or she just needs that money today. And that's what the market kind of looks like right now. It's like, I feel really, really scared for outdoor farms that are not vertically integrated. $150 pounds. I was saying at Meadowlands, I'm like, why the fuck are we here if we're selling $150 pounds? When we all know we could be in the traditional market. When the tax is like, what, $130 on that pound? Yeah. And then if you want to, you don't want to hand trim it because then you're paying another $150. The trimming would cost you more than the pound. You're crazy. Well, so so what are, because I had heard from in my own network, like $300 was the the cheapest outdoor pound. What prices are you seeing on the indoor stuff? I would say indoor is the only thing that's been a little bit more consistent. So I'm still seeing a $1,500 and up. If you have really sought after genetics and really nice bag appeal, you could be like $25,000, $3,000. it's really interesting because I've seen things as cheap as like 150 bucks. Granted, they're like smalls and nothing crazy, but it's unbelievable to see that things that were $500 last year are like 150 right now. Things that were, you know, outdoor, which usually is like, you know, 700, 800, 9 dollar product, like you say, are going for 300, 400 if you're lucky. Um, And what's so sad about it, too, for me, is that some of these are, you know, heritage growers, you know, second, third generation, and they've been doing this their whole life. Their flower is impeccable, and they're still sitting on some of it from last year. And, of course, I have to say I'm a sun-grown girl, and as being a country girl, like, I feel for small farmers. Oh, yeah. I am literally cannot disagree on even the scale of like i've seen like a like the flocana news recently which is basically flocana is going out of business and they're liquidating all their assets and you're talking about a really large well-funded conglomerate that went to all of these heritage farms all of these generational humble trinity farms mendocino and promised them price points they never came back with the price with the cash for so oh yeah we're gonna buy everything at 800 come back. All we got was 450 because the market crashed. I I feel the worst for sun-grown farmers out of all because 
they've gone through so much to have these farms and a lot of them only have one acre a lot of them you know they get one annual harvest if they're not profitable from this annual harvest then what's the point of next year what's the <laughs> point and when we're commoditizing things so fast i'm one for price setting you know like cannabis has been price set forever when i was in tennessee i paid 60 to 75 dollars for a good eight and i'm sure people still are like it's just a price set thing it doesn't matter yes. where you go but right now like and i when i was in wholesale um like logistics and warehousing i was doing a lot of like green water heaters kohler like really old industries and was learning about oil price setting learning about water heater price setting i mean every industry price sets why would you create an industry if you're gonna sell lower than the cost of production that is Amen. insane it's the we are capitalists are we not like we're in america like what are we doing creating industries where the taxes are more than the product that you're creating that would be sensationally. That's like, because yeah. special interest is the freaking fourth branch of our government now. Yes. And and businesses are people. So, you know, got to look out for them. Yeah. Um, but, no, I'm joking. I know. Well, but this is, I mean, this literally became part of our constitution. You know, I've been doing a lot of homework on how the fuck is this system supposed to run? Right. Because whatever is happening now, like, I don't think this is what our forefathers had in mind. No, definitely. Even when I think about economics and capitalism, you know, it's supposed to be the best quality for the lowest price. But somehow we are in a warp of it's only what we offer you in this, you know, cyclops of information and production. And anyone's competition, we buy them up before they can even become a competitor. So long story short, it's like even a... I read that Daily Beast article recently that came out and everybody was really up in arms and it was just like, yeah, this is what everybody already knew. Um, these are oligarchies. These are monopolists. They are want to consolidate cannabis faster than cannabis can even be created. They're like, great, go in, pay all the money, wait two years to pull all the permits, make sure it's up to code, put in the sprinklers, put in everything you need, then we're gonna buy it. And we as operators were so burnt out, some of us from all of the roller coaster of this this economy that we're barely even making money in if we're lucky. So yeah, I just I was reading it like duh. If you look around and you see, you know, the true leaf, you see the Cresco, you see four main people, Tilray lobbying, acreage holding, lobbying, doing all the behind the scenes stuff. Like we're over here. Do, 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 do. like this is america yeah small business we're all gonna have a chance to <laughs> succeed and like i was so mind blown from the transition in california from prop 215 to prop 64 like that just exploded i i had a feeling like it was going to be hard to get licensed and i thought like a grandfather concept was why i was like i was rushing to get all my incorporations documents done 2014 2015 because i just had a feeling that was going to be a cutoff that was irrelevant totally not what i thought it was going to be except for the farm a little bit um but literally when i was looked up from the transition and looked around i was just like this is a completely different society all the small businesses were extinct all my friends that created like dope edible companies the best honey you could ever have like even to this day in california like i know people in every market and I've seen different types of flour from all markets. And I promise you the things that the street has are better than the things that the storefront has. And it's hard argument, even for some of my friends to try and reel them in like, well, you should pay $90 uh, for this eighth when you're getting it for 35 from your friend. Well, and if you know your farmer, like if you, you're getting it off the street, but you knew who grew it, why wouldn't you? Why wouldn't you do that whenever you see the options that you have? And, you know, there was when you were saying that it just made me think of my favorite edible that disappeared when Prop 64 came around. It was like Moon Man's Mistress or something. It was in the Bay Area and they were doing amazing cookies that were just like packed full of really good ingredients and nutritious. And and Delicious. yeah, and they just fucking went away. I don't know what happened to them. Yeah, especially the baked goods like those that market was really hard to get permitted and get the manufacturing licenses and the commercial kitchen build outs that were done and like those. And it was really sad to see like the edibles brands, the teacher brands like 
gone. Like, yeah, it's just like in most industries where you have that whole 80-20 rule, 20% have 80% of the market. But I really think it's higher. I think it's like 10% have 90% of the market in cannabis. I would agree. Oh, yeah. Even if you include, especially if you include multi-state operators, like your GTIs of the world, like we're in the wet, like, you know, California, we live in a bubble. We live in our little bubble, like, especially I'm in the Bay. So I'm in like a real, like a bubble insulated inside <laughs> of a bubble. And then I'm like, oh, that's going on the East Coast. Like these things are moving and shaking. And I'm like, I had no idea, you know, or I, I, I just have not interacted with a lot of these MSOs and I'm like, mind blown from the things that they've been able to monopolize in such a short amount of time and like be like we i put out this workbook with a group um super awesome workbook but it's the working life group and we did a workbook for like how we see a fair legal construct especially when it comes to like social justice and social equity programs and even more so like the uncapping of licenses so if you know, if Cresco gets to go in into a specific city and say, well, we only want 10, there's only 10 licenses going in this city and we want them all or this state or this municipal, whatever it is, keeping all the other people out, it just exacerbates the monopolistic mentality of this industry, which is so like, it's just contradicting for why we're all here. It's just unbelievable. So just going back to the sun grown farmers, like imagine, like imagine like that's you're here selling weed for $150 watching these true leaves pull 80 licenses and monopolize a whole state and then you're watching like these special interests pull all the medical licenses because that's what it's all that's what it all comes down to now it's like who has the medical license they're all gonna get grandfathered in it doesn't matter the new rules doesn't matter like what equity priorities they want to come in with or how they want to empower people that were affected, those original licenses are like, bloop. and then it's like, these usually, these usually get sold to the med men's when they existed oh, so or gross. some of these, some of these other special interests. And then you, we've literally just watched something that used to be so independent and craft based. And even if you were a large farmer, like quality was your total expectation to you know 50 acre farms 100 acre farms that are like no lights high yield low quality and nobody really knows anything it just you know? that to me just i i have a name for it i call it walmart weed because it's Absolutely. just like gross what Absolutely. why I would really like to see this workbook that y'all put together. Send that to me and I'd love to to share it because we need to have fresh ideas of how this can work because everything has been done the same way over and over. You know, we had an opportunity to take cannabis and treat these farmers completely different than we have in every other industry, but we haven't. And yeah. Leafly's Cannabis Harvest Report that they recently put out where they're like, okay, the FDA does this for everything else, but they don't include cannabis. So what does cannabis look like in this whole snapshot? And, you know, it's like the fifth biggest cash crop in the United States, and it's not even federally legal. And, right. you know, we're already shitting on the farmers. And so it's like... It's still early enough to like pull the fucking plane up and not do the nosedive. $831 million went to the general fund. I mean, what you, the farmers, who? I really would like to see the spreadsheet of where all this money is going. Exactly. Exactly. And then only one, I saw one municipality, I think it was Mendocino, gave a million dollars back to the farmers. And I'm like, good old Mendo. Great. But that, like, that, that amount of money literally equates to like this year for probably one farmer, the difference in the amount of money they're making per pound. Like probably way different. Like when you go to a 90% drop, a 60% drop in your price, like, and then increased competition and all of these weird things going on, like. You're not even. Dollars. Yeah. And it's like the cost of living, you know, it just continues to ramp up. You can't even afford to live like these farmers. Most of the time, they also grow f food crops so that they can sell in their local markets and stuff. But God, it's so much work. It's so much work Absolutely. for right now. Such a little payout. Absolutely.
something that's like, you know, $5 a pound. The, the things that are $5 a pound selling at the market are keeping them alive where the $150 pound over commoditized item is now driving them into the ground. What in the world? Crazy. It is crazy. So one of the things that you're an advocate for that I've read about is like the the social justice and the equity in the cannabis industry, which is kind of like what we're kind of talking about right now. I recently read that some of these Oakland equity companies are now being sent to collections because they couldn't pay their loans back. So what in the fuck are we doing about this stuff? This for me is so surreal because when the loans came out, they were like payday loans. Like you could borrow this money, but you had to immediately start paying. Even though it was no interest, there's no point in giving somebody money you need right back. I think Drake said that. (laughs) 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 Don't loan me any money that you are going to knock on my door next week for. And when a small business, when we all know small businesses don't even make a dime for three to five years, and that's when you don't have 280E, the unrealistic expectation of the city of Oakland that these loans were going to be paid back. I think it was literally one month. They had one month till they started making payments. I, I, if anything, it might have been 90 days. It, it was like a payday loan, literally. So watching them then come for someone that didn't make payments on a payday loan is unreal. Like with, keep in mind, this isn't Oakland's money. This money probably came from an equity program disbursement. It's just disgusting like this. But even for me, like one thing I'm so concerned about is everyone's tax liability. Like I've seen equity holders that did deals with large corporations, like large delivery companies, because no one was using that license. And they came in and then operated for a year and left a million dollar tax liability for excise tax or whatever the different tax was on the license of these. This is like an equity person and she had to scream and shout and go to the office of cannabis and threaten to go to the media and all these things to get them to pay so it's like watching this and i've said this earlier is just that we engineered a system ripe for corruption there's no way that you could take people that come from impoverished communities that have been impacted by the war on drugs meaning they didn't have lawyer money or they wouldn't have been in the case to begin with and then tell them to go fund a cannabis business in the most expensive state that there is And they're not going to give you any money. Like by the time you qualify for a grant, it's $40,000 and you have to be in planning. So you like, like, you have to have your lease secured for a year and a half to even get into some of these positions in planning, depending upon your scenario. So, I mean, it's a bit of a comedy and a tragedy when you look at like how these roles, these laws are written and then they're going to come after Then The Oakland thing just blew my mind into shreds. I think like the advocates in Oakland will get that reeled back. Um, I hope so, because Oakland, when I I lived there for three years, and the one thing that I would always say is out of everywhere I've lived, everywhere in the world, I felt like Oakland was a place where everybody's culture was embraced. Everybody's voice was given an opportunity to be heard, whether or not that is, you know, your street festivals or, you know, going to City Hall or whatever it was like everybody had a voice. And so I was so shocked to see that they were taking the steps of sending somebody to collections over this, especially when it was the very first equity program. So it's like, really, this is the precedence that we're setting and hailed as the most successful, like, oh, please let me load my revolver. (laughs) I was watching this, I was just so sad. Yesterday, or I was researching more in that Daily Beast article, which then led me to a Vice article about how white people and social justice movements are getting like wrapped up as a way to get funding and licensure access. And it's just total debacle, which then led me to these original SF Chronicle articles shitting on the Oakland equity program, like really shitting on Denise Brooks, the um, supervisor, I believe that created all the bills and all. And I was just like, oh yeah, I forgot how these people were talking. Like I forgot how anti, and it's like, once again, you have the medical program here. You have the equity program here. All of the medical program in Oakland was like, what are you doing? Like, you need to take care of us. Like, forget equity. And we're not giving any money to equity. Like, you need to look out for us. So you see this timeline and this evolution. And now collections 
on these same people that they were supposed to be helping. I don't know. It's very disgusting, but I do hope, I think that Oakland is going to um, not go through with the full. The course situation. correct. It's so interesting too, because I'm like, I worked on a technical assistance grant for success centers with uh, all the verified equity applicants in San Francisco. So uh, it's very interesting to see like Oakland versus San Francisco because San Francisco was like this with their grant money and they wouldn't even let you spend your grant money on rent when they originally brought it up. They're like, you have to spend on compliance. So your attorney or, you know, your architect or like, ha like straight money going wow. to someone else, not for inventory, which is the irony of that is like, imagine a loan from the government to help COVID restaurants and not be able to spend the money on the restaurant. Ooh, yeah, the it makes no sense. On the inventory. So like, oh, like San Oakland gave money, but I was like, you're giving money all the wrong way. Like the, a payday loan does not count as helping people. And then in San Francisco, I'm like, give the money, give them their money. This is not your money to dictate, you know, give it to the people, accept their receipts, treat it like any other grant. Yeah. Like, who for? Like, yeah. it's just. Mm. So, you have a strong voice in that space. So, like, what's happening? Are you doing something right now to kind of help move the needle back? Yeah, I think that there's a lot of groups in San Francisco and Oakland coming together right now to try and really advocate for ways of extracting this money. Like, Oakland, um, there was a group that got a $2 million grant to purchase a building and they're doing shared kitchens and they're going to create a ton of equity brands out of this building. San Francisco doesn't have any of those things yet. So we, like, I am actually actively waiting for the next oversight committee meeting so we can talk about other ways to spend grant money. Cause it's so tricky. Cause we have like a hundred storefronts pending to open in San Francisco. And like, what about all the other people that were affected by the war on drugs, but they don't want to open up a storefront with 1% profit in cannabis. You know, there needs to be like multiple avenues to make sure that this money is going to the people the way that it was intended to. Um, well, so shit, I just even think about like during the riots when all of the cannabis businesses that I knew where I lived in downtown Oakland, like their windows were smashed open and all of their inventory was stolen in one day. And it's like, now what do I have? I don't have a business anymore, especially if I can't spend money to restock product. I mean, no. and even if you had insurance, I highly doubt they paid out. Like that was a, a act of God. It was like a riot. You didn't get any of that money back. People were... I mean, it's just been like hit after hit after hit when it comes to compliant cannabis for a retailer, even like there was no product on the market. There's all these new taxes. People are so upset. Now you get looted. And now the even when I, I was talking to a friend of mine that works for a large distribution company to retail and he said BDS analytics on retail are down 30 percent for the last quarter. And that's probably, if not Bay Area, all of California. And I'm like. Prices are lower than they've ever been. How are sales so low in retail? Interesting. You know, I didn't know that. And and I do find it funny whenever you look at the press that's out there and it's painting this beautiful picture of, you know, California leading the way. And like there's all this diversity in product now and diversity in ownership and all of the things. But when you look under the hood, it's a fucking mess. Oh, yeah. And even the diversity in products, like I loved when I would start really educating myself because I was a buyer for a long time. And I'd look at one bag and I'm like, oh, this is relabeled. This is the same batch, same cultivator as this bag, which is relabeled. And literally one harvest might have 20 different brands, 30 different strains. Like it's the fakest market I've ever seen. Like it's just white label everything you'll have I was, I was like oh i thought you guys grew weed no <laughs> just a flower brand just yeah. a fancy box just marketing just all of these different things and it, it reminds me of like alcohol very quickly like that ab bev model where you own modello and you own corona you own every competitor and you make them look different and you trick people and this is the organic one and this is the cheap one and cannabis in california is that to me yeah. in a nutshell it is. Have you thought about ever leaving California and going back? Like if Tennessee were to legalize, would you go home and redo this model there? I've always been 
interested like my brother would say absolutely like he would qualify for social like i would qualify for social equity i, I would assume in tennessee because i've had like like a charge expunge there it wasn't anything crazy but my brother would qualify in virginia so i think like we would definitely want to see that through and and pull our licenses in that way if we could i now that California is so saturated, right? Like the only places you really make money in California are emerging markets or having something really special going on or a big brand like Stizzy, like you're making money. Um, I think it's like very interesting to, to reframe my life, right? Like I never thought I would leave California at all. Like, I don't know. But now looking at the economics of these things, like I really want to focus on emerging markets. Um, we have a, a dispensary application in like a final stage for redwood city which is right by san francisco airport and it's a dry county san mateo county the whole county is dry right now so these will be the first six storefronts in san mateo county which is unbelievable and we started in redwood city that's where our delivery service was for years and years and years where we have all of our patients so we're really like gunning after this license and it's probably the most valuable license right now in california because it's Silicon Valley and it's like yeah. super, every, everybody has a license in there. So there's 18 of us that are gonna get final selections down to six. There'll be six licenses going in that uh, city. Now, so, how are they making those decisions? Are they doing it based on the financials, but then also the background of the people and trying to make sure that they're giving diversity a, a shot here or is it just in order? <laughs> that's such a good question oh my <laughs> gosh um i can answer this question in detail the they're scoring our application in phases so the first portion of the application which was mainly the business plan the financials the security plan the fire plan like things you usually hire your fire consultant and your security consultant and your attorney is putting together very carefully for you and uh, we did the pro forma and the business plan together so that was phase one. So phase one is like dull. Uh, just give us the the very specific information that we're looking for. Nothing about the owners too much. Phase two, um, where we're at now, they're going to go into the more developed part of the application. So it'll be ownership, uh, credibility. There will be a community investment plan. So like who we're giving money to or the things that we want to do in the community. There's an equity, diversity and inclusion part, but it's not, as you know, of like social equity programs. It's just like LGBTQ friendly things, hiring women, paying a living wage, like offering benefits, like those things, which like for me, I'm just super hoping that like I'm majority owner, I am a, a lesbian and I started in Redwood City and all of these different diverse things that are going on, right? Like my dad is Jewish. I think I cover a lot of like- You check a lot of boxes. Them. Yeah, like I'm like, yo, if you guys actually care about any of these things any further than this one part of the application, I think that we would score just naturally really well. Um, what else is in there? Oh, location and neighborhood compatibility. Those are the two things that are the next biggest part and the highest value in this final portion. So location, 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 <laughs> who you are, where the money is going, and then a few other things about equity, inclusion, diversity is, is the final piece. So then it goes to the city manager's desk because these portions are scored by a third party. And right now it's HDL, which is an interesting group can look them up and uh, they score a lot of applications around California. So after HDL scores it, it's going to go to the city manager's desk and she's going to make the final decision on those six. Well, good luck to you. Now, um, one last thing that I want to touch on, you were featured in Forbes and by you, I mean, one of the companies that you are responsible for creating legacy coterie. And you were featured as one of the top five cannabis consultants. I don't know if that was in the U.S. or in California or what, but <laughs> this is your distribution sales consulting side. So if there are people that want to either get into the industry or they're struggling in the industry, tell me what you guys do there. 
yeah, that really came out of a lot of advocacy originally and just knowledge that I had on delivery. So delivery consulting for me. And then I have some really expert partners that have built out brands like Dosis and Northern Emeralds and um, Bloom Farm. So they're really good when it comes to sales strategy and taking over markets and being very deliberate and intentional about how you do that. Um, my side of it now has really evolved a lot in mentorship and brand creation and equity brand creation. And I work with this super, super cool chick, Jessica Strange, that I did our technical assistance grant with. And she is like a guru in licensure and state licensure, local licensure. She's done over 2,300 um, state licenses. Like nice. she's crazy. And she's just the most giving bird. Like both of us are are very giving with our time. We do a ton of pro bono consulting. So right now I've been spending a lot of time with people trying to open up storefronts in San Francisco or get nursery licenses in other cities or a lot of legacy operators that are trying to transition out of whatever their traditional market is right now into getting compliant. Um, and then social justice elements for sure like i'm speaking in new york city for on the revel event about predatory practices which is hilarious i have 10 minutes to talk about predatory practices and i'm sitting here i'm like i don't even know how in the world i could talk about this for 10 days um but just giving my personal experiences i do a lot of just contract review um mainly like if it's a big brand or somebody that's like not equity then I'm happy to charge, but majority of the work, I just try to make sure that I can give a little bit of an attorney, a little bit of a consultant, a little bit of like, you know, a permitting expert, but give you an hour of my time and then hopefully send you somewhere positive and we can have an ongoing relationship depending upon your needs. But it's been very interesting because I wasn't really ever, I never thought of myself as an expert until I started paying experts. And I'm like, okay, cool. I, must, I must be an expert. <laughs> I must be, I don't need to pay you anymore. Okay, cool. um, like one conversation with this guy. One, and I try to like take a lot of my experiences back to the nonprofit that I work with, Success Center. So I was paying a consultant um, recently who raised like $36 million for um, Canna Craft back in the day. And I was building data rooms and getting consulting on like a lot of these large raises and investment decks. And then I took all that information and put together like a two hour presentation for all the people going through equity. And Jessica and I are just trying to get like an encyclopedia basically. So instead of people individually calling us needing help for standard operating procedures for delivery or inventory procedures, we just have an encyclopedia of information that's vetted and they can have it for free and hopefully fast track them to a better place. I love it. I think you're amazing. We've never spoken before. Like I told your publicist, I want to talk to you. And so here we are. This has been such a refreshing conversation. Is there anything that I didn't ask you that you want people to know? Shameless plug, anything? <laughs> um, That is super cool. I would say I'm working with a couple equity brands that are about to launch storefronts in San Francisco and have brands um, I'm going to plug something. High Purpose is my buddy, um, Damian Posey. He has went to jail. He has come out of jail, mentored, fed, and provided anything that anyone needs in the community for years. So much so he has a key to the city from the, like, from the mayor. And he's just amazing. And all the money that he makes from High Purpose, he puts right back into the community. And he's partner with Harborside on a store that's opening up soon. But um, like, I just like brands like that, man, like real yeah. people doing real shit in the community. Like put your money where your mouth is, buy that over the Walmart wheat, right? Yes. Amen. I like that. Now, if you go to the top right corner of your screen, there's a little button that says comments. And before we end, I'd like for us to just scroll through here, see if we see any questions that we need to answer. Okay. I see lots of good comments, but not um, any questions for us. So right on. Thank you, everyone, for participating. Sean, Kevin, Ace Boggy 3223 <laughs> Tony. Hi, Tony. Yeah. Beans Harley. He always is the first person. I assume that's a he. I don't know a woman that wants to be called Beans. I did have a horse save me once. His name was Beans. <laughs> 
we were working cattle at Fourth of July. I was on a horse that I'd never been on before, and it was a show horse, not a working horse. And it got spooked and took off, and I was like a little eleven-year-old siren on the back of this horse, screaming my head off, just hanging on for dear life. And this badass horse named Beans came racing up and like calmed my horse down, so we stopped. Oh my gosh! Yeah, that is so cool. <laughs> <laughs> I went to camp when I was little. I wish that I had access to some horses. So you were you grew up in the city where you lived in in Tennessee? Yeah. Well, I grew up in Mount Juliet, which is about twenty five miles outside of Nashville, Tennessee. So kind of country. Um, but I went to high school and middle school. My mom. It was funny. I came home. I came home from kindergarten. I was talking like this. <laughs> My mom's from Buffalo. Um, New York and she was like oh no honey we are transferring you so she transferred me <laughs> to Metro Nashville schools so I went to school in the city but I grew up kind of in the country that's hilarious yeah I'm full-on country girl and you know it was like 70 miles to the town where we bought groceries so wow. yeah when it was time to go I was like you know, adios amigos, like I'm going to the city. And now at 45, I have found my way back to the country and I'm living on a farm in Northern California and loving every minute that's of it. Cool. Yeah, that's amazing. I hope one day to do something similar to that. Well, I think you you're doing think. amazing things and um, I look forward to one day meeting you in person. But thank you so much for yeah. hanging out with us today. This was really, really a pleasure. I love, I love the format. It was super, super insightful. Even like your questions are questions people don't normally ask. I like it. Oh, it I dig great. it. Now I should have you on an episode of Roll With Me. Do you roll good joints? I feel like you can't not. It was funny. Today I was like, I was sitting here and I was like, oh, are we smoking? And then I had like my little black blunt leaf ready to go. It's weed ready to go. And so I'm super excited to roll with you. Yes. Yeah. We'll get that going soon. All right. Well, thank you all for hanging out and um, we'll talk to you soon. The big takeaway, we can't wait for others to step up. This train is moving fast. So there's no time like the present to advocate for access and social equity. And listen, focus most of your energy locally. I know it can be so overwhelming doing your homework, asking the questions, starting the dialogue. Make it simple. For example, if you live in California and you don't have a dispensary in your town or county and you don't have access to delivery, I bet you're not the only one that's pissed off about that. Start there. Now, if you live in a state without a developed cannabis market, it's go time, my friend. Things are happening. The wheels are turning. Find out who the state and local players are and how far along they are in creating the regulatory bones of the legislation. Meet your state and local representatives. Call their offices. Attend city council meetings. Join local and regional organizations. Get involved. And what's so cool, you don't have to have the plans. You don't have to know how it should all go. Other people have already been there, done that. So share that Cannabis Social Equity Program Advocacy Handbook that Marie and the other members of the Working Group Coalition put together. I've said it once, I'll say it again. It's in the show notes. Cannabis is the most regulated consumer-facing industry in the United States. The regulatory framework and compliance requirements from pre-licensure all the way through to financing and actual operations dictate and create the supply chain. So if equity and access is not advocated for at every step of the licensing process and accompanying regulatory framework, social equity applicants and operators will be set to fail from the beginning. We've seen it here that's why I take these lessons and use them in your own state. The policies written create the industry. So let's make sure we're learning lessons and adding the necessary guardrails to protect black and brown people going out for licenses or small farms or mom and pop businesses. Protect these vulnerable groups from the predatory landscape that we know it can be. Now, if you're inspired by today's chat with Marie, 
I hope you'll share this podcast with your smoke circle. As always, email your requests or can of curious questions through the website or DM me on social. I'm at Casually Baked on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, and the Weed Tube. And if you find value in the quality cannabis content I'm churning out every week, please become a podcast patron for $5 per month at patreon.com backslash casually baked. However you choose to support this highly responsible cannabis movement, thanks for doing your part to puff puff, pass it on. Casually Baked the Podcast was created, recorded, and produced by yours truly. Editing and sound design are in the capable hands of Arnav Gupta. The podcast theme music is by my highly talented friend, Seth Walker. If you aren't familiar with Seth's music, you can find High Time on his album, Gotta Get Back, wherever you're buying your music these days. I know he didn't create High Time for me, but it sure as shit sounds like he did, right? I hope you'll tune in next time. Thanks for hanging out. Thank you.